by Matthew Barth, The Role of Vehicle Automation and Intelligent Transportation Systems in Sustainable Transportation Issues and Research Opportunities. Thank you. So uh, my name is Matt Barth. I'm the third of the four siblings within the Barth family. Uh, so like my siblings, I uh, graduated from CU. I graduated in 1984. Uh, then right after that, went out to California. So California went out to UC Santa Barbara, met my beautiful wife, Kathy, and uh, got my master's degree and PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, after that, went off to Japan, did a postdoc, did uh, some research in robotics for a couple years uh, before coming back to California and got a position at uh, University of California, Riverside, relatively small UC, but now has grown up to be quite sizable. So. You know, I guess I've always had uh, interest in electricity. I've been the only, uh, I guess, uh, engineer uh, in the family. I guess as an electrical engineer, uh, as I said, you know, electricity's always interested me. But, but again, it was a pretty big nudge from my dad too, our, our father. So um, he sort of introduced me to this company called Heathkit. And if you remember uh, Heathkit, they're they're the ones that put together these packages, these these electronic packages where you would. Uh, get these things either mail order or down at the store and then you would uh, put together the different electronic components in the circuit boards and put those together to make something. So throughout you know the younger times we put these different things together starting off with real easy stuff to start and then building up to the larger things like televisions and I remember uh, to this day working uh, with our dad just building these different television sets and getting them to work and smacking them once in a while if they didn't work quite right but uh, Again, that was sort of uh, my introduction to electrical engineering. Um, so another uh, area that uh, our dad really liked was cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> as you probably uh, heard from Scott, you know, you, a little bit of racing going on there, I guess, in the desert. But this is just sort of a, uh, a compilation of different cars with help from my brother, Rob, that uh, put together these different pictures and different uh, uh, the cars that dads had throughout his lifetime, starting with the very early Fords and the Pontiacs and different things like that. You can see various pictures of dad as he's sort of growing up with his family. Uh, and you know, a couple of key things that you see here, you know, one thing that he liked to do, and he did this twice, he went off to Europe, uh, bought vehicles in Europe, and then brought them back here to the U.S. And that happened once with these Volkswagen Bugs that you see there, and then again uh, with the BMW uh, at Yasaka. Um, one of the other key vehicles is that blue Blazer, 1971 blue Blazer. I think a lot of people in the parking have seen it in the parking lot. That's been a great vehicle for our, our entire family. We used to go off to uh, Canyonlands and Utah and do all sorts of jeeping, and that's sort of been passed down between the different siblings, and we've always had a good time with that vehicle. So, uh, great lover of vehicles. Um, the the, the uh, other part of that, though, is that I think there's a lot of people out there like cars, right? <laughs> so, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, this is just a, a snapshot of what we often see in California, and, and it's not just California. I know Colorado and other places have quite a bit of traffic. And this is, this is kind of what I study. This is something where, you know, I, I started in the robotics area, kind of got into the vehicle automation side, and then the, what we call intelligent transportation. But it's really to solve these type of problems, right? So. If you have a lot of vehicles and not enough uh, lanes and not enough freeways, this is what you get. It's a congestion problem, sometimes what we refer to as a resource management problem. And so, of course, you can go out and build more lanes and more roads and, and just uh, solve the problem that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we've seen from the data is just the demand's going to continue to go up and, and this type of congestion is always going to be there. So really the, the way to, or one of the ways to solve this is to apply what we call these intelligent transportation system techniques. And I'll go through a couple of those uh, just to show you the type of things that we're working on. So, you know, again, sort of the environmental aspect of that is looking at what are the energy and emission impacts from surface transportation. So if you look at total CO2 going up in the atmosphere, roughly 30% is from vehicle surface transportation. And so the, the general four ways to solve that are, you know, you can build cleaner, more efficient vehicles, and we're certainly doing that, right? We have a lot of hybrids, electric vehicles, all these different things, and that's, that's, a, that's making a, a fairly good impact. Uh, you can change your fuels, right, getting away from uh, uh, carbon-intensive fuels and going with, the, uh, you know, less carbon-intensive. Uh, and you see that with, uh, 
with ethanol and then getting into the biodiesels and electricity. Um, one thing that uh, all places, uh, you know, particularly in California, need to do is see how we can potentially reduce the amount of driving. I mean, there's still quite a bit of driving that goes on, of course, with commute trips and other trips, but uh, things like uh, travel demand management techniques and things like that can certainly help there too. But it's really that last bullet that, that I've sort of focused in on it, which is how do we improve the transportation system efficiency? And, and again, you can do that mainly by coming up with these intelligent transportation system techniques, and a lot of that's tied in with what we're going to call connected vehicles, and then also looking at vehicle automation. So I, I won't go through all these in too much detail, but this sort of shows you the different areas of what we mean when we talk about intelligent transportation systems. Right? So we sort of have this vehicle category up there at the top, system category in the middle, and the behavior part down there in the bottom. But you know, the vehicle side, it's, it's again getting into sort of that the automated vehicle technology. And you're going to put in new controls that do uh, longitudinal control, lateral control, you know, avoiding collisions. Uh, these new systems that are here today, these adaptive cruise control systems that adjust the speed of the vehicle as you go down the road. And these are all sort of partial automation techniques and even steps that we're already doing. So when you think about, okay, the Google car is going to come eventually, you know, we're already doing these incremental steps, these, these uh, things like adaptive boost control uh, that's leading on to what's being called cooperative adaptive boost control. But there's many techniques that we're already on that pathway. Um, the system technique is, uh, again, very data driven. Uh, so you, you want to monitor what's going on with your, your roadways, uh, how much traffic do you have, what are the densities, uh, things like that. So if you have data, then you can make better management techniques and better control systems to you know, control things such as traffic lights, ramp meters, and different things like that. And then lastly, how can we affect behavior? And if you think about it, humans aren't too efficient when it comes to driving. You know, we have. Uh, uh, different acceleration patterns, decelerations, we have delays, we have latency in terms of how we drive. And uh, when we sort of get away from that by automating it, we can, we can do it a lot more efficiently. So those are the general three areas. Sort of the area that's really been popular the last five years or so is this whole concept of connected vehicles. So connected vehicles, what that is, is essentially giving every vehicle a radio. So a radio that can sort of either listen or broadcast information. And the idea is primarily from a safety perspective. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration is mandating, is, is likely to mandate radios and cars starting up in 2017 or 2018. And the sole um, reason is it's just like, uh, you know, mandating something like uh, seat belts or airbags or anti-lock brakes. The next step are these radios. And the idea is to send out these basic safety messages. Other cars can listen to that. Uh, these safety messages contain what's your position, what's your heading, what's your speed. And from that, you can avoid crashes. But in addition to that safety aspect, you can use that information to improve mobility, uh, you know, get a little bit more organized in terms of how you get the, the vehicles down the road. And then there's an energy and emissions benefit too. So you can design these specific applications. So. Uh, I'll just go through a couple. Uh, one that we've worked on lately is what we call this eco approach and departure at signalized intersections. So very simple concept. It's if you take a traffic light and if you broadcast signal phase and timing to all the vehicles, instead of you know synchronizing traffic lights, you let the cars do the work. Let the cars speed up and slow down so that they can minimize <coughs> congestion and minimize the amount of energy that they use in order to get through those different intersections. So, you know, I think humans kind of do this already. We look down the road, we anticipate a red light, we might let off the gas a little bit early, or if it's green, we might speed up a little bit, you know, hopefully safely and get through that green light. So it's the same thing. It's just that we're having an uh, onboard computer do that. We're using this same speed up, slow down technique in order to do that. So hopefully the simulation models. Yeah, so we, we do a lot of simulation modeling. So this is actually pretty high, high fidelity for each one of those vehicles. It's you know, roughly uh, 100 millisecond update rate, full vehicle dynamics where you're looking at the interaction of vehicles. The upper one is showing typical baseline uh, numbers of, as how vehicles come into the traffic lights. And then if you do this equal and approach and departure, you get a little bit better uh, smoothness to the, the traffic flow 
And this is uh, probably a typically 20% difference in terms of energy savings when you look at the top to the bottom. Um, not only do we do it in simulation, we do uh, on-road experiments. This is work that we did out at Turner Fairbanks Highway Research Center in McLean, Virginia. And this is, again, um, the, the speedometer device there is, is basically telling the driver what's the optimal speed to be at. So that little green zone on the speedometer is indicating to the driver what speed he should be going at. And as you can see, as he comes around the corner here, the, right, the light just turns from red to green and he didn't have to come down to the full stop. And of course you're trying to do this safely, but uh, that's the type of thing that, uh, that we're able to do. Um, but the, the, what we're finding though is that you, know, you don't want to necessarily tell drivers how to do this. It's much better if you automate it. And so that's what we're doing now are these, what we call these glide path projects that automate vehicles through intersection zones like this. So we did this demonstration and a, a week or so later uh, President Obama came by and he thought it was pretty cool, so we, we went on from there. Um, other things we can do, um, this is a cooperative adaptive cruise control. This is showing a typical traffic light and when the light goes uh, red to green, you sort of see the typical release um, on the top. But if all the cars are talking to each other, when that light goes from red to green, everyone can move together. And just that simple example of, you know, when you wait around for the next guy to move and the next guy to move, that's roughly a 17% difference in terms of energy savings. So there's a lot of these little things you can do in order to make this work. Uh, intersections. Um, this one here, you have a typical stop sign uh, intersection in the upper left. The right is a, a traffic light. But uh, maybe in the future, it's something there where you don't even need a traffic light. Right? So instead, every car is talking to each other, and you're reserving a slice of time and space in that intersection. So that's a, and this was done by a graduate student, and he thought it was pretty cool. Um, the, the catch is that everybody has to have the same algorithm and the same radios on their car. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so just to sum up, so, so the whole idea of this intelligent transportation systems, you know, we always talk about three things, safety, mobility, energy, and the environment. And it's always safety that gets the big bucks, the mobility is sort of the secondary thing, and third on the totem pole is, is the energy and emission savings. And really that's where, you know, I try to put a lot of my research is to say, can we design specific strategies that, that really go out there and reduce the amount of energy we use with, uh, with transportation? Um, and then there's a lot of things you can do, and each one is maybe a 5, 10, 15 percent savings, but if you add up all of them, you can start to make a pretty, uh, pretty significant dent. Last slide uh, on automation. Uh, so we often hear about automated cars and autonomous cars, and I want to make sure we understand the distinction. An autonomous car is one that really doesn't communicate, it doesn't have those radios, instead it has sensors and can sense the other vehicles and basically drive around by itself where uh, an automated car or an, an automated connected car is one that can also talk to each other and you're going to get a lot better efficiencies when you do that. So people have always said if you get every car out there to be autonomous that all these traffic congestion problems go away. It's been shown that if you make them all autonomous, it's not going to improve that much. You still have the delays and things like that. But if you allow them to communicate, it's a lot smoother and you can do a lot better. Uh, and all this stuff is great. The only problem is that if you start to introduce all these automated vehicles, you got to worry about induced demand. You know, pretty soon you're going to have cars that are taking your kids to the soccer matches, uh, taking uh, people on other trips, and the whole worry is just about more and more trips. So um, the idea is that if you introduce more and more automated vehicles, you're still going to have to worry about uh, things like travel demand. So that's pretty much what I want to talk about. Thank you. I'm reminded of a natural system, and that is bird flocking. And um, of course, they don't have traffic lights or intersections to worry about, but they never run into one another, as far as I know. Right. Have you learned anything from or you've studied this? This is this is all part of a, a field called multi-agent systems, right? So flocks of birds, bees, all these different things. It's the same thing. You're you're assigning behaviors to specific agents. In this case, vehicles and uh, developing behaviors, whether those behaviors are human behaviors or automated behaviors, it's all part of that same multi-agent systems uh, technical field. Right. Uh, 
talking of energy efficiency, I ride an electric scooter, and there are many people in this room who are probably bicycle. And to be honest with you, I am petrified of those vehicles <laughs> driving around, talking to each other, but completely ignoring us, <laughs> not in the vehicle. <laughs> so so uh, in, in this whole connected vehicle area, we often talk about vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-infrastructure infrastructure communication and vehicle to X. And X in this case are pedestrians, bicyclists, and everything else that should know what's going on. So there's been uh, experiments or field studies that have shown, you know, uh, with a smartphone, if a pedestrian is going to walk across an intersection, it very likely could be saying, hey, there's a car coming. It might just beep your, your cell phone or, your, or something like that to warn you that the car is coming. Yeah, but I want the car to be told too. Watch out for me. So anyway, those are, those are the algorithms you want to develop. And so, one of the most interesting things is to forecast when the automated driving will actually take over. And what's your forecast? What, what, what I mentioned earlier, we're already doing these partial automation steps, right? So we, we drive a car with adaptive cruise control. We're driving in the, the congestion of LA. We turn that on and we don't, our feet don't touch those pedals. We're basically, the car's speeding up to slowing down with traffic. It takes about two weeks to get used to it and trust it, but once you do, you, you're, you're, you're doing that. To get to the final full automation where you can uh, trust an automated car to drive in a dark rainstorm in Detroit with uh, you know, tall buildings and all that, that's probably still 15, 20 years away to solve all of those problems. But all these partial steps, I think there'll be quite a bit before that. Yeah, I was wondering how uh, work in the U.S. compares with what's going on in Europe or uh, Asia, you know, Japan or so, in regard to the things that you're working on. Are we leading the pack? Are we are we way behind, or where do we stand? We're, we're roughly equal. In fact, we have a couple joint uh, experiments with with the Europeans. We're gonna we're gonna do a demonstration with our European colleagues this summer. Um, I would say in this case of uh, what we call environmental ITS, the Europeans are probably a half year to a year ahead of us. They're already deploying these pilot studies where our pilots are going to start probably in another six months or so. Uh, Japan is very uh, proactive. They've been doing a lot of things like this. Uh, they, they do a lot more from an individual vehicle point of view, but less so from the system. So it's, it's roughly equal. I mean, you could pick one particular topic and choose uh, someone that's slightly in the lead. But we're all sort of progressing together. So that raises a common issue with technology. Are we going to be using the same radios, for example, between Europe and the U.S.? Everybody's agreed on that now? It's a great question. We haven't even solved the common protocol yet within the U.S., right? So we have the Society of Automotive Engineer Standards, but we're still working out, you know, differences. It's kind of like a Betamax, VHS type of thing right now, where we hopefully get to one protocol. Uh, Europeans do have their own. It's very similar uh, components in, that, in those messages. It's just a different sort of structure. So the idea is a couple more years, unify that, and we should be in good shape. We'll go ahead and stop there, but thank you. Great. Thank you.